The following is an evening darshan class given by His Holiness Jaya Pataka Swami Maharaj on October 16, 1982 at New Panihati Dam in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. common people that usually become infatuated by seeing the mystic powers displayed by persons who do either through yoga, through tantra, or through some other methods, gain some kind of supernatural power or ability. But actually, they do not realize that to what extent a devotee of Krishna is mystically perfected. Because the devotee of Krishna is not interested in gaining some cheap following by showing tricks. So ordinarily he does not reveal any mystic powers even they have. So similarly type of situation was created about 500 years ago, 450 years ago in Orissa when there was a mystic yogi who could fly around. I think I explained this to you once before. And all the village people came and approached Vasikananda, the disciple of Shamananda Pandit, and said that, oh, you should go and see there's a yogi who's flying around on a twig, on a branch of a tree. And at that time, it was early in the morning, Rasikananda, one of the great acharyas in our line, was brushing his teeth with a neem twig, as is customary in India. You see, Indian made the custom as you brush your teeth with it twig of a specific trees where the saps are antiseptic and after you finish, you divide it in two and you scrape your tongue and you throw it away. So it's perfectly hygienic. Keeping the toothbrush for months on end. It's not very hygienic. They are daily disposal. So he was at that stage of his morning duties when these people came in all excited about some mystic yogi. So what is this mystic yogi? We are engaging in devotional service. This is a prime verse. But don't know, but he's flying. So they, they were very excited. It's normal people if you see someone fly around. I saw one of the uh, commercials or something on the plane or somewhere. I, saw, I forget I saw some. Maybe it was in the magazine. Showed some... Uh, Basketball or football player flying <laughs> to get his luggage or something. <laughs> People like that very much. And even in uh, 
in another exhibit the 360 degree yeah. vision sometimes they put on these uh, ma- what do you call it? multimedia mass no, multimedia or 3D then they show people flying and you going around like this people like to be free like the bird you see so anyway in that time they were very really excited that this person could fly So Rasika Nanda, he just took the twig out from under his, from out from uh, his mouth, put it under his leg. <laughs> Chanting Hare Krishna, he was going around the ashram, flying around. <laughs> <laughs> he landed back down, continued brushing his feet. What do we care for these things? We're interested in serving Krishna. <laughs> Then all the village people, they <coughs> ignored that yogi. <laughs> Similarly, of course, <clears throat> many millions of years ago, Dravasa Muni, who was so powerful, he would always go with thousands and thousands of followers behind him. And he is actually a Manas Putra, or mental son of Brahma. So he possesses all the eightfold mystic powers, and not only that, but he has exceptionally uh, powerful siddhis, or say, mystic yeah. powers more than the ordinary, and he is known to be easily pleased as well as very easily angered. So he can easily give someone a blessing. I believe he gave Draupadi the pot of unlimited food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the same time, he could easily become angered. So he became angry for no reasonable reason, for no good reason, at Maharaj Ambarish, the emperor, in the, in the Satya Yuga. At that time, he created a demon to kill the emperor who was a pure devotee, who was daily worshipping the temple, but he was a married man. He wasn't a, a renounced a sage like Dravasa Muni. Nonetheless, because he was so well situated in pure devotional service, when this demon was released to kill Ambarish, the Ambarish was protected by the Sudarshan Chakra, the disk of Vishnu. And as a result, that Dravasa Muni had to run for his life. The demon was helpless, and the uh, Dravasa had to himself run. So, of course, now he ran, he went to Brahma, he went to Shiva, he said no one could help him. He had to go all the way to the Vishnu Loka. When he finally came to Vishnu Loka, then he asked Vishnu to forgive him. Can anyone find that verse in the, in the sixth canto, I believe? Any of you read the sixth canto? Not yet. <laughs> Tidra Bhakti would have read the sixth canto by right now. So then, he fell down at the feet of Vishnu and said, Please save me from your personal weapon. It's in the sixth canto, isn't it? Ambarish. Ambarish is eight? No. That, that white one is, is the duplicate or what? That's part two. So what are the other ones? This one or three? This is the Narayan Kavacha in the offense. This uh, part three is all Chitra Ketu. Lamentation on Gira Muni. Mother Parvati, Kirsten, Chitra Ketu. Oh, I remember the seven can't go with that. There's eight. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Krishna's Yoga Maya is high. I thought it was a multiple of three. Ahang Bhakta Paradhino Yasvatanta Iva Tvijat Sadhu Bhir Gasta Hidayo Bhaktaira Bhakta Jana Priya Translation The Supreme Personality of God had said to the Brahmana Dravasa Muni, I am completely under the control of my devotees. Indeed, I am not at all independent. Because my devotees are completely devoid of material desires, I sit only within the core, the cores of their hearts. 
What to speak of my devotee, even those who are devotees of my devotee are very dear to me. And it is sadhavo hidayam mahayam, sadhu nam hidayam thvaham, madanyate na jananti, nahante vyo managati. The pure devotee is always within the core of my heart, and I always in the heart of the pure devotee. My devotees do not know anything else but me, and I do not know anything else but them. So then he told him that he had to go back and repent to the devotee who he offended, that he himself was not able to forgive him for the offense. So then Dravasamuni again went back to Maharaj Ambarish, who of course, being a humble devotee, didn't even hesitate in forgiving him for any offense. And this way Dravasamuni, he could understand what was the uh, power of the devotee? Dravasamuni came and touched the feet of Maharaj Ambarish. He fell down and clasped the king's lotus feet. When Dravasa touched his lotus feet, Maharaj Ambarisha was very much ashamed. But when he saw Dravasa attempting to offer prayers, because of mercy he was aggrieved even more. Thus he immediately began offering prayers to the great weapon of the Supreme Personality of God. Then after the, the uh, hearing the uh, prayers of uh, Amritish, then the Sudarshan Chakra stopped burning him with its effulgence and fire. Then Devasa, he began to glorify Amritish. My dear King, today I have experienced the greatness of devotees of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for although I have committed an offense, you have prayed for my good fortune. For those who have achieved offense me, he tried to kill Ambarish. And instead, what is Ambarish is praying to save him. He tried to kill Ambarish, and Ambarish in return saved his life. This is the quality of the devotees. For those who have achieved the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Master of the Pure Devotees, what is impossible to do? And what is impossible to give up? What is impossible for the servants of the Lord? By the very hearing of His holy name, one is purified. O King, overlooking my offenses, you have saved my life. Thus I am very much obliged to you because you are so merciful. Expecting the return of the Rasa Muni, the King had not taken his food. Therefore, when the sage returned, the king fell at his lotus feet, pleasing him in all respects, and fed him sumptuously. Thus the king respectfully received the Ratha Muni, who after eating varieties of palatable food was so satisfied that with great affection he requested the king to eat also, saying, Please take your meal. The Ratha Muni said, <clears throat> I am very pleased with you, my dear king. At first I thought of you as an ordinary human being and accepted your hospitality. But later I could understand by my own intelligence that you are the most exalted devotee of the Lord. Therefore, simply by seeing you touching your feet and talking with you, I have been pleased and have become obliged to you. You see, then Dorasa took permission, left, continued to glorify the king and through the skyways, through his mystic <coughs> power, he went to the highest planet of Brahmaloka, which is devoid of agnostics and dry philosophical speculators. The actual power of a devotee is beyond the ordinary external shows that even the mystic yogis are able to produce. Actually, Popat is explaining that nowadays what the material scientists are trying to do, or what they've even done to some extent, are the same type of uh, perfections that are there in mystic yoga. For instance, once there was a disciple of, uh, a German disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And then he was asked, why you don't go for mystic powers? He said, one of the mystic powers is to go anywhere at will. So that's what the scientists are doing. They're going by jet, they're going so many places. 
Another mystic power on Nima is to become smaller than the smallest. They have the microscope, they're going and seeing the small things. To become bigger than the biggest, they have the telescope to see. Then to create wonderful things, they're always creating wonderful things. So these are this material things. Basically, these mystic powers, maybe they're done by the psyche or by the spiritual uh, spiritual uh, development of a person. But after all, they're also a type of material desires. The same things that are the eight mystic perfections, the yogis one, that's the same thing that the uh, material scientists are uh, doing in part or trying to do. That way, the one mystic power is to do things which are incredible, which are inconceivable in nature. And when we saw this uh, exhibit, they're always showing that what we've done so far, how far we've advanced in the future. Are you to tomorrow? <laughs> this is what the materialists try to make everyone feel very happy for tomorrow. But of course, people only want to live a short time in this body before they go on to the next body. So what the tomorrow holds for them in terms of their material life is one thing, but then they should think about Actually, what is the next life that they're going to go to? And most of all, they should try to get out of the cycle of reincarnation and get back to Godhead. That is the real freedom. That is called liberation. Sometimes people get confused the different types of liberation. Actually, the uh, Lord, when he was glorifying his devotees, at that time he described them in this way. He said, Matsevaya Pratitam te salukya di chatush sayam nechan te sevaya purnaha kutomyat kalavit plutam. Translation, my devotees who are always satisfied to be engaged in my loving service are not interested even in the four principles of liberation, Salokya, Sarupya, Samipya, and Sarshti, although these are automatically achieved by their service, what then is to be said of such perishable happiness as elevation to the heavenly system? Heavenly, excuse me, as elevation to the higher planetary systems. So, there are five types of liberation. It only mentions the four here. Having the same form, living on the same planet, having the same opulence and having the same so having the association because the other fifth in uh, mukti or liberation of merging that the devotees don't even consider at all that they completely discard I was telling the the uh, pastime how when Bhakti Thakur was going around the different islands the nine islands of Navadvip when he came to the island of Rudra Dwipa, crossing over the Ganges from Madhudram Dwipa. You see, in Madhudram Dwipa he saw Lakshmi and Narayana in their full glory, where they have the nine different uh, place of Vaikunthas there in Rudra Dwipa. But since the devotees are not interested even in seeing the Lord in this very glorious uh, majestic form, they want to see Krishna in his more loving form. So he crossed over and went to the next island, Rudrudvi. And there he saw the pastimes of Radha and Krishna and the gopis and the original Rath Lila place. And they saw also that Lord Chaitanya was chanting there with all of his followers in the same mood of separation. That actually the Sankirtan movement is not different from the mood of the uh, residents of Vrindavana chanting in separation of the Lord. Then he was walking and all of a sudden he saw this woman coming. A young woman, her hair was, she was uh, appearing very, very simple, very pure, but her hair was a bit disheveled and she was wearing complete white and she was crying, she was upset. And he saw her come, a little bit distraught, and she was saying, that I am so unfortunate, I am so unfortunate, I have been deserted, I have been left. 
He said, Lord Chaitanya has come and given the mercy to everyone. Given the mercy to everyone. But I have been deprived. I have been left. He says, once I was, I was uh, filled with so many, with so many associates like Martin Bea and others. Now they're all gone. Dr. Bhakti again, who is this person? Then she identified herself, I am Surujya Mukti. I am the liberation of merging into the effulgence of Krishna. So by Lord Chaitanya's coming, all the souls that were attached to come to me, they have all left and they have all gone to the spiritual planet. They have all engaged in pure love for Krishna and pure devotional service. Now no one is merging anymore. <laughs> so in this way now I am all alone and Lord Chaitanya, he's, uh, won't he have his mercy upon me? What about me? But as soon as Bhakti Thakur heard Samusha Mukti merging, he <laughs> ran. <laughs> The devotees don't want anything to do with this merging. I was preaching in India on one pakka, you call pakka means they're well cooked. Mayavadi. <laughs> one pakka, Mayavadi. <laughs> no one merges because we think the Lord's body is the absolute truth. Isn't it? Yes, because Krishna is the absolute truth. Because we are individuals, therefore, there's no reason to want to lose our individuality and merge. Rather, the served, sure. the servitor, and the service, these three we want to maintain forever. And through that exchange of the served, the servitor, and the service, we exchange transcendental loving relations. So when we merge in that, then the distinction of the knowledge, the knower of the, of the knowledge, and the thing to be known, they become one in the person's consciousness. So we don't want that uh, non-differentiated state. Okay. You see. So I was talking to this one person, the Pakka Mayavari, <laughs> and uh, he was again and again bringing back this point that to have no quality is higher. You see, and we kept bringing the point that in material quality there's many, many defects, but in spiritual quality there's all variegatedness, and that spiritual quality is much more relishable. And we just kept coming back and back again that no, what about I mean, no quality? <laughs> <laughs> so then I said, when you take your lunch, you have your rice, you have your dal, you have your japati, you have your two, three vegetables your chutney, your sweet rice, your, your achar, mango achar, everything, you have chili, lemon, salt, you see. So, so you take, when you want to take your lunch, you take one at a time or you take the whole thing and <laughs> make a ball out of it and eat. <laughs> you want merging or you want one by one? Why do you say this nonsense about that? No one takes like that, it just makes a mash. You see. Variety is the spice of life. <laughs> you see, material variety is temporary, therefore we're disgusted in the long run with it. Because it frustrates us. We try to enjoy it, but it escapes us. Again and again. Until we get frustrated, then you want to say, no quality. But beyond this quality, non-quality of the material world, far beyond that, far beyond the limits of material energy, far beyond the completely disintegrated, completely the, the uh, original source of all material energy, the Mahatattva, beyond that ocean of material energy which is effulgent, lies the spiritual world. And in that spiritual world, quality and non-quality both have their existence. But quality is considered to be the higher truth, the highest truth. And in that quality, there is a complete absorption in transcendental ecstasy, an appreciation which never eludes the devotees. They eternally reside there in complete satisfaction. As mentioned here, they get those four types of liberation. Even if they don't care for it, they automatically get it. Because they're completely fixed in this service to Krishna. 
So after that he signed up and agreed to chant 108 times yeah. Hare Krishna every day. Yeah. <laughs> By Krishna's and Prabhupada's mercy. Yeah. So this is the difficulty people of different levels, either they're gross materialists or they're infatuated with mystic powers or psychic uh, experiences, or they finally get frustrated, they want to merge to actually come up to their real appreciation of eternal variety, variegatedness, qualities. This is something which is very rare. Krishna describes in Gita, Sahasya Ishu Manushanam Kastid Dalari Siddhaye It's a Tana Bhi Siddhanam Kuchin Maan Veri Tattva You can't find that? Sahasya Ishu Manushanam Who said that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was being surprised by Frank. He's going to better be right. Huh? <laughs> 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 you read it. Translation? Yes. Out of many thousands among men, one may endeavor for perfection, and of those who have achieved perfection, hardly one knows me in truth. So out of many thousands who are seeking the truth, you see, some know what is the truth, and out of thousands of them, one may actually understand, may actually realize the truth, or achieve perfection. And out of so many perfected souls, it is rare to find one who actually knows Krishna the personality of Godhead. So this is a very rare status to actually be God-realized. But Srila Prabhupada has brought this to the West in its original form. And therefore, whether one is East, West, North, South, the spirit is beyond all this. Spirit is beyond the body. We're not this body. We're not American or Chinese or Indian or African a Russian, you see, we're not dog or human. We're pure spirit soul. And so the soul has its eternal relationship with Krishna, the supreme soul. And that goes beyond all the external bodily designations. So every soul has the potential to be God-realized. But that potential is dormant in other species of life. But in the human species... The consciousness is expanded enough that we can actually realize Krishna simply by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 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 Hare Hare, and engaging in devotional service or bhakti yoga. Hare Krishna. Any questions? Why are people attracted to the personal philosophy? Some people are just attracted by what is about it that attracts them. Because it's the opposite of the material world, so it's very easy for them to understand. Just by speculation, you can come up to the impersonal idea. Here, everything has got quality, you get frustrated, you're fed up, then the idea of just ending. Why do people commit suicide? In France alone, last year, there were 75,000 people who committed suicide. I don't have the statistics for America. No, 75,000 attempted it, and 15,000 succeeded. It came in the paper because three of them had this book, How to Commit Suicide. It was a new book published. <laughs> <laughs> and they challenged the They gave a different methods of easy suicide. And they died with the book by them. So they people were challenging the author that you're responsible for murder. And he was accounting that no, they wanted to commit suicide anyway. I just made it. I just made it less painful for them. <laughs> In the future, suicide will become an accepted thing, just like uh, you know, stomach pumps, abortion, whatever. Suicide. We'll have regular clinic, extermination clinic. You just go in. <laughs> he was predicting like that. <laughs> So actually, the impersonal philosophy is uh, very easily understood by mental speculators. So people are attached to mental speculation. You see, well, you can't actually, the 
to understand Krishna, there's no way you can speculate that Krishna is eternally a youth, that he plays with cows and has a flute and he rides on Garuda. These things you can't speculate. These were found from the Vedas. So then when we have the Vedas, it requires faith. Do you want to believe in the scripture or not? To believe in impersonal, we can just speculate that. It's a, it's a, you don't have to really believe in much. So people get attracted to that. Also, Prabhupada explains in the Bhagavad Gita, was that one Gita Raga, Gita Kota, Gita Raga, uh, Gita Raga, what number is it? 14. Give the book to our Muni <laughs> over there. Gita Raga, Vyakroda, Gita Raga, Vyakroda. We should give up anger, fear, and uh he says uh boy uh being fears and attachments fear as anger. Before his Lord in me and taking refuge in me, many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me, and that's the only thing chance in the life of me. So the in there it mentions about uh uh in the purport and it mentions about impersonal realization, how people get they get angry with everything and they or says anger, one of those. Generally, people who are attached to the violent conception of life are so absorbed in materialism that it is almost impossible for them to understand that there is a transcendental body which is imperishable, full of knowledge and eternally blissful. In the materialistic concept, the body is perishable, full of ignorance, and completely miserable. Therefore, people in general keep the same bodily idea in mind when they are informed of the personal form of the Lord. For such materialistic men, the form of the gigantic material manifestation is supreme. Consequently, they consider the Supreme to be in person. And because they are too materially absorbed, the conception of retaining the personality after liberation from matter frightens them. When they are informed that spiritual life is also individual and personal, they become afraid of becoming persons again. And so they naturally prefer a kind of immersion into the impersonal form. Generally, they compare the living entities to be bubbles of the ocean, which merge into the ocean. That is the highest perfection of spiritual existence attainable without individual personality. This is a kind of fearful stage of life, devoid of perfect knowledge of spiritual existence. Furthermore, there are many persons who cannot understand spiritual existence at all. Being embarrassed by so many theories and by contradictions of various types of philosophical speculation, they become disgusted or angered and foolishly conclude that there is no supreme cause and that everything is ultimately void. Such people are in a diseased condition of life. Some people are too materially attached and therefore do not give attention to spiritual life. Some of them want to merge into the supreme spiritual cause, and some of them disbelieve in everything, being angry at all sorts of spiritual speculation out of hopelessness. This last class of men take to the shelter of some kind of intoxication, and their effective hallucinations are sometimes affected by spiritual vision. That's your question? Yes. Um, Srila uh, Sankracharya uh, came to uh, preach the impersonal philosophy, and <coughs> it, it, it described that he had two, three motives involved. One was to uh, reestablish again the authority of the Vedas, to drive the Buddhists out, and also to increase pride. Is that true? Yes. So I don't understand why is it that third one, why do we want to, what was the purpose of that? Well, why the Lord wants to increase the human beings, that's the Lord's plan. We know that when people become more fixed in personal philosophy, then they, they, no longer does the spiritual realization hold that much attraction for them. Then they want to enjoy the present senses more, so that produces more sex activity, which produces more children. Basically, if there's more human beings, then there's more of a chance for people to get liberated, because only the humans have a chance to get liberated. So that's a special facility that Krishna is giving for the animals to move up and become human. And so then Lord Chaitanya's movement by chanting Hare Krishna liberates so many more people. But of course, all of the purposes why the Lord wants to create increase the human species. 
and known best to him. But that is one of the obvious advantages that so many souls in animal bodies can move up and become human beings and take birth in human body and a human body can achieve liberation. So, so I was just wondering um, how, how is it um, that the spirit soul when we leave the kingdom of God how is it that he reduced his size to the point that he's no bigger than the chicken on the head? So we then obviously combine the spiritual world somehow. Yeah, the spiritual world is beyond time, space, and dimension. Just like the whole spiritual world can fit in the tip this pen. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, the, the spiritual world is many, many times bigger than the total number of material universes. You can't limit the material, the spiritual world in anything. Everything is relative. If Krishna is one ten thousandth tip of a hair, near one ten thousandth tip of a hair, and if everything is the same size, then everything's normal size. Right? Right. But that doesn't mean that Krishna's that size. It's Krishna's normal size. But the spiritual world, since everything is relative like that, doesn't actually fall under all these different kind of definitions. It's actually uh, irrelevant. Once you get to the spiritual world, what the size is is irrelevant. But comparatively to our understanding now, Krishna is five foot ten, so we also have a similar size. So it's described that when we come and fall down, we lose the form, and we come in a seed form, a dormant form. So just like you have a big tree, but then it has a little seed. So the soul is in this form, is like a seed form. And then as you develop your Krishna consciousness, again it grows and grows, you gradually redevelop your spiritual form. That's why the example is given like watering the plant. And the seed sprouts and it grows and grows. And as it's growing, your spiritual siddha deho is again manifesting. I just said the first explanation just to, because the whole concept of size, which is like a rigid type of thing, loses its relativity. Because in the relative world, everything is significant in terms of its measurement. But in the spiritual world it goes beyond those conceptions. That's what I was mentioning at first. I just understand it's not the same kind of creation. Here is relative world, it's absolute. But the actual thing is now that one ten thousand tip of a hair is this dormant spirit soul. Based on the first part of your answer, is that uh, how it is that one when, when a person comes purified, he can actually see his own spiritual reward? Yes. Is that a similar uh, experience that brought you know, it's like over the field when you study how you go and feel how you can actually see this amazing, amazing type of situation? This type of, uh, in the holy dawn, you see, these pastimes are always existing. But they're not ordinarily visible to the conditioned souls. So pure devotees aspire to see those pastimes. Sometimes they see or sometimes they're aspiring to see. And even in aspiring to see, it's actually not different from seeing. If you aspire to serve Krishna, that's not different from serving. If you aspire to see Krishna, that's not different from seeing in terms of spiritual uh, reality. Prabhupada explains it's like a green mango and a ripe mango. If you desire to be Krishna conscious, you will be Krishna conscious. Only a question of time separating you. But in the islands of Namadya, that's actually a replica of the spiritual world is there. And that is under the spiritual manifestation. It's not under the immature world. Is that the same situation about Sankirtan? That's why even a person who is engaging in Sankirtan purely they're also under the shelter of the spiritual energy. They also, through their separation, one is told that if you can't physically reside in Vrindavan or Mayapur, Mathura, then by separation mentally one 
desire to reside there or should be residing there. And that way, while you're serving, you're actually in the holy down. That's why the pure devotees, wherever they go, they bring with them a moose, what can feel the atmosphere of Vrindavan, of Maya. Wherever Prabhupada went, he felt that was Vrindavan, just by his associates. Because the holy dham is not limited by time and place. And of course, why Krishna says, my pure devotee, I'm in his heart, and he's in my heart. So wherever there's a pure devotee, Krishna is there. I have a question? Uh, like earlier when you mentioned the uh, story of the broomstick in the, in the two but in the mystic power, in the relationship, in not seeking the mystical power from the material end. Um, what if it with the, the Ishvara, the, like the demigods from the upper planetary system, like Narada Muni given the power to go between the material world and the spiritual sky, which from the Shastra seems to be an exceptional, an exception, you know, to a lot of power, you know, and even in superhuman beings. Could the demigods, can they come down and are they authorized by Krishna to do something mystically? Like if Indra's got tired of sulfuric acid rains and, you know, plutonium in the, in the rain, could he, like, come down and do something mystical about it? <laughs> and he would be authorized. <laughs> During the Dwarpa Yuga, the demigods used to come here on this planet to attend in the sacrifices. Then the guys get a share of all the sacrifices so they used to come. But now, because uh, the human beings have become so degraded, the problem said we don't even come here to urinate. You can imagine if they came, you know, the UFO, UFO, please, 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 please. I see something on my radar screen. Hold me. And then suddenly, you know, okay, give one ICBM, whatever, enter the ballistic missile. Okay, we got him sighted. <laughs> then you got to see that what are the human beings that in completely uh, sulfuric acid rain. <laughs> They're making such a mess of things. Who wants to come here? They can't believe that how the human beings are making such a mess of things. And in a sense, if the human beings, as you say, the scientists seek the eightfold mystical path and they create so much destruction in nature, would it be a violation if someone had the discipline to gain the mystic power to merely reestablish the status quo and then not be her like her own Shakti Guru and seek, you know, to be a pilot to the mystic power. That's why normally the mystic power is achieved by those who are who get uh, develop their good quality. But the thing is that anyone who tries to control the material nature ends up in so many ways becoming entangled. I was trying to play the part of God and then try to correct everything. Then you see, just like the scientists who wanted to move the foxes over to Australia to eat all the rabbits. And then by doing that, then all the rabbits, or what was it? Yeah, the the rat, I mean the mongoose to kill rats in Hawaii. Or the mongoose to kill the rats in Hawaii. And then there's so many mongooses and so many uh, foxes in Australia, there's not, no predator of them. They were thinking to bring in tigers to kill the uh, <laughs> to kill the foxes, but then they thought that if they got out of hand, they'd have <laughs> <laughs> So in the same way, and when you're trying to adjust all the mistakes, uh, then you, you you know you have to really be on top of the whole thing, not to again make another mess of it. Right. So, like so that's what happened. That uh, this one demon tried to uh, fix everything up, and instead he made a mistake and dumped the whole earth out of orbit, and it fell into the bottom of the universe. <laughs> And then he had, then uh, Baraha mm-hmm. had to come and lift it up. So this is always happening. The materialists, you know, they're trying to manipulate like that. Yes, I've heard of a scientist in South America, a German scientist, who tried to cross the South American lead with a normally peaceful, I believe it was Italian lead, and it was, he created a race of killer bees that have been, that have been moving north ever since, and they expect in 10 years they're going to cross the Mexican border. And these bees uh, are terrible bees, and they've killed hundreds of people and uh, thousands of cows. And some, so we're in the predicament. When the killer bees get here, what can we do? <laughs> Offer them a new queen? <laughs> I don't know. 
But I mean, you know. Why is that for the killer bees? <laughs> 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 it does it, Kudzu. Kudzu, that's what they call it? No, Kudzu is a plant that uh, was a, they imported it from, I think, Japan. It was supposed to save the south. And um, it, says, it turns out it, it, it's completely... Why don't you turn the video on the people that speak and ask questions? Why, why didn't someone run with them? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this one plant that grew everywhere now, but you can't... They can't stop it in any way for a good Because of it. Because of it, yeah. Grows over houses, everywhere. It was supposed to be just like for, uh, for stopping erosion and for pastures, for cows. But now everywhere you go, all over the south, it's going everywhere, it's going buildings. They can't, there's no way to stop it. Okay. It's going in the past. And it's not being used because it's supposed to be. So then you try to use your mystic power. <laughs> Cut to, be gone. Be gone. <laughs> yeah, then all the houses will fall <laughs> Where the roots have gone in the houses. Because once the, these plants go in the, in the foundation, then when they die, then the whole foundation is like... Much you loca. I'll just tell how I agree. Is it so that the demigods Prabhupada said that actually they want to come and take birth in this movement because this movement is actually more important than the mystic? Much more important. Mystic power is not very important. It's not material thing. The real thing is to be able to chant Hare Krishna and to liberate one from all the karma. Mystic power, if you start using it, then you're making mass karma. The trouble is they get the mystic power and they misuse it. Just like Vishwamitra, he had a whole big fight with the Shishna Muni. They started throwing weapons back at each other. And they, they became so much into this uh, fight with each other that why they cursed each other to become what, ducks. And then they were stuck as ducks. Because <laughs> they got so angry that they're using their mystic power and they turned each other into birds. And they were fighting, then, you know, before they realized that, no, <laughs> They used up all their mystic power and they were stuck as birds. So then they had to be saved from that condition. Then they did again the penances and they would build up their, uh, of course they were in the Satyuk, so they had a lot, a lot of years to do it. And finally again they got their mystic powers back. So it's very dangerous. Uh, you're not free from karma just because you have mystic power. In fact, if you misuse the power, then you get mad karma. It's just like these big scientists that you look at a picture of Jimmy Carter. Because this being a president, you get one sixth of all the karma of the nation. He was four years a president, and look at him, he aged about 20 years before and after shot. Because all that karma is on him. In four years, how much sinful activity was performed in America? <laughs> <laughs> and how much pious activity? Pious activity nowadays is, you know, but this much. So they should give a chart, like in these papers, they give all the charts. <laughs> We have all these charts. So here's the declining church attendance. It has all these charts. They should put up the charts of the sinful and the pious activity mm-hmm. over the past 200 years. See what the charts are. Like. So big uh, leaders or, or yogis, if they try to manipulate, they make a little bit of mistake. And how they're not God, they don't have all knowledge. They don't see the overall plan or what's even going to be the effect. He may take the sulfur out of the ring right now, but that may create some other imbalance. It's not done in the right way. The best to leave them the job up to Indra and tell them, if you want to do it, you can become Indra. Be in charge of the ring. But then you'll have to be stuck there in Indra Loka for a long time. Then you'll be crying, if only I could have come down with Lord Chaitanya's movement, chant Hare Krishna for 50, 70 years, and gone back to Krishna Loka. No. Instead of having the headaches, how to fix up all the rage in the universe that were messed up by the human being, <laughs> by the atomic explosion. You're right. You're 100% right. Because they probably have another atomic war 10,000 years from now. <laughs> I'm with you, Jarvis. <laughs> <laughs> you know that uh, it gives him some of the other Puranas that in the previous Kali Yuga, 
that there were intergalactic wars between the different demons. Wow. And they were having, it's actually in the Vedas that there were star wars. <laughs> they were real star wars. And they were shooting rockets at each other with like atomic warheads. And they're having this, and they're creating such a habit that a different avatar Buddha came down and got them all to stop fighting and meditate so they could become, achieve nirvana. Where else can you get such knowledge as this other than the Vedas? You're living in a temple now? Yes. Of the service now? He told me ten times the priest brought the body before the priest. Big kids? And you were killed with pets by a couple of people. The killer plant. Rotted by the ass, man. Which were rotted by the ass, man. They're not that rotted. Can't you just cut out the roots of the cousin? Yeah, we did that. It was a very prolific time. Everywhere, all over the entire stock. What about our cousin? Yeah. We, we cut it up every year. We cut it up. It comes back. Well, there's some hope. I've got a whole rift catalog. It shows a Japanese farmer standing behind Josiah Kudzu, twice as tall as he is. And I can buy a little booklet for two dollars. Apparently it's a wonder plant. It's supposed to be nutritious and it's supposed to have a bunch of herbal qualities. We count kudzu Yes. Can you tell that story that you were going to tell in Rome about this, um, this situation party? I already told them, or I say, like, <laughs> that's what they asked me. You know, the devotee priest with the uh, idea of attempting to convert the person he's talking to, or with the idea of simply uh, making a presentation of the cross, and, and how can one do that without? You see, we're not after a conversion. It's like in India, they they offer people 50 rupees, a radio, a chicken, a pig, and a little shack, and they convert to a Christian. You see, we don't want people to convert, because actually, everybody is originally already Krishna kind. There's nothing to convert to. They're all originally parts of Krishna. They all have their eternal relationship with Krishna. Where's the question of converting? You see, the thing we want them to do is to be convinced. We want to give them spiritual knowledge. We want to convince them. What's the use of our speaking if they don't understand? Or if by our speaking they don't become more convinced? Our point is to convince them. If we can convince them, about the truth, they will become peaceful and happy in their life. They can go as far as they want to go. So we then, as more, as much as they are open for learning, we decide to give them that understanding and to convince them. Once they realize who they are, it's no question of conversion. They just realize who they are. Automatically they're situated in their original position. It's a question or other of uncovering all the superficial designations that identify them until they come to the identifying themselves and their real identity as service of Krishna. Therefore, Krishna consciousness is actually the truly non-sectarian path. We want to convince people to take up the chanting of the Holy Name. We don't care if they want to change their name, if they want to continue calling themselves a Jew, a Christian, a Muslim, whatever they want. We want them to understand that they're not the body, that they're true spiritual, <coughs> that their eternal condition is to be free from all the material laws of karma and to be situated in God time. Is that all right? Yeah. It's either preach to the soul and the heart. It's either break through the mental, intellectual coverings and preach to the soul to awaken. Real understanding. 
Once a person understands that they're not the body, that they're not this material temporary body, then automatically all these ideas about conversion and everything, they're no longer relevant. Because a person is born as a Baptist or a Jew, or because he's adopted a certain mental idea based on imperfect understanding of what he is. Therefore, all these different ideas come. We want to actually just go to the root. Who what a person is, who he is, what is his relationship with this universe and with the original being. And automatically people become situated in a natural blissful condition. Perfect eternal moment. What he read in the Bhagavad Gita? The different stages that were mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita? Basically, eight stages up to pure love for Godhead, starting from faith to association with devotees to practicing devotional service under the guidance of bona fide guru. At that stage, one accepts initiation. Then one goes higher to that, from that, and uh, gets rid of all the unwanted habits and unwanted attachments in the heart. So one becomes fixed, nishta. From that fixed devotion, then one again goes higher to getting a taste in devotional service. Then one comes up to becoming attached, ashakti. Then finally one gets ecstatic, brain bhakti. So all these are stages going up to pure love for Godhead. Now in the fourth canto Bhagavatam of the teachings like Kapila Muni, he mentions that devotional service can also be in the mode of passion, or ignorance, passion, and goodness. So those three basic divisions. Ignorance is where one is angry, envious of others. There's some of these people who are, obviously they have some devotion to God, but at the same time, the ones who are carrying around this big sign, turn or burn, <laughs> they show a guy being turned on the fire, like a roast chicken. <laughs> so, there's some devotion to God there, but it's like in the mode of ignorance, because it's like so envious of others, and it's just promoting a very angry kind of intolerant mood, without really perfect knowledge. Still, there's some devotion there, obviously, at least there's a recognition of God. So in this way, it's described of the mode of bhakti and passion where one wants to get fame, <coughs> prestige, or wants to worship God to get some material prosperity. Then there's more bhakti devotion and the mode of goodness where one wants to get liberation or elevation, mm-hmm. like that. And then those can be further divided by different mixes. One part ignorance, the two part passion, like this way you can get 81 different varieties. And then from there you can take it on, on into life. So, basically the different religions in the world are different levels of devotional service mixed with passion, ignorance, and goodness. And when you come up to pure devotional service which is not mixed with passion, with goodness, or with ignorance, then that's known as Sudha Bhakti. 
the Bhagavatam, very first canto, first uh, few verses. Do you have it? Or, uh, you want to say it? Is it first? That's what it says. It describes how this is Nirmatsarana. Uh, this is practiced by those who are free from all envy and is completely transcendental. Did you have any questions? Hello, Rick? Is Yeah, I, I had a similar question also a few days ago about the different kinds of devotional services and the different modes of nature. I was wondering, does uh, Krishna or God accept these kinds of services and these different services and these different modes of nature? And is it the service itself that is uh, contaminated or is it the service for? Well, the pure soul is never contaminated, but it's covered. Just like if you put a piece of yellow cellophane over the light, you're going to get yellow light. But coming out of the bulb, it's coming out white. Because you put a piece of yellow cellophane, it comes out yellow to your eyes. So the spirit is always pure, but you put the covering from the mental consciousness, intellectual consciousness, the covering the soul, and because the consciousness is, is uh, manifesting with the touch of ignorance, passion, or goodness, and accordingly you get black, red, or yellow. And the pure white, sukla, that is uh, possible only with pure devotion. So it's not the soul that's contaminated, but it's the material covering. Therefore, we, we are trying to convince people of their real identity, engage them in the pure activities, so then that's when the covering is purified by chanting, by serving, by wiping the floor in front of the deity, or helping <coughs> chop up the vegetables and doing whatever service may be. You see, then their, their consciousness becomes purified, and then they can actually see things as they are. That's why we try to engage everyone in chanting and serving and taking Krishna and Prashana, so that they can become purified in their original consciousness. I think that was half your question. We had another half? Whatever portion of it is devotion. Except, but the thing is that people with this type of mixed bhakti, they don't want generally the spiritual truth. You see, so they get a material result. Because they're desiring something material, they're getting a material result. But because it has some connection with Krishna still, that's why we respect those people in our hearts. That's why we have some devotion. But then, in terms of preaching, we have to smash them because many times they're misleading. Do you have any questions, then? Have to go. Have to go? Yeah. See you for tomorrow for the feast? Yeah. I'll be staying home tonight. Okay. It's been a pleasure to see you again. You're looking well. I'll get a pleasant drink. Very nice. You were there for spiritual reasons this night. Well, country. I mean, it's a country where they make crime on government money. Couldn't pay much more for government than that. Could do a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, what was your name? I'm Brian. Ron. Brian. R-O-N. Brian. Not Brian. I'm Brian. I don't see anything. Anyway, I'll... No. Yeah. Is it Ray or Ron? No, Ron. R-O-N. Ron. You know that Rana is also a name for King? Ron. Yes. Ron. Yes. In Sanskrit. Spiritual. That is to be king of the senses. Maharana. Right. <laughs> Maharana. <laughs> it's also known as Goswami. Uh, one who is controlling the senses. That's right. I'm on a path, but it's not the same path as yours. Path would be impersonal, but it as a step toward the personal. I want to explain that briefly. Uh, and get your feedback on it. Um, kind of is, is my answer to his question about the stages that we go to go through towards Krishna consciousness. And my understanding is that um, it's a meditational yoga path. My understanding is that you first have to realize the self before you can even really begin true devotional service towards God, because if you don't know yourself, how is it even minutely possible to know God? So the, the thing is, that as we go through the Gita, 
um, it's kind of, the idea kind of talks about the task chronologically, and that, like in uh, chapter 2, verse 45, is where it first says to be without the three units, be beyond the three units, be beyond the field of the relative, establish yourself in how do you do that? How do you get beyond the three gunas? My, the way I'm practicing transcendental meditation. How does that take you beyond the three gunas? Um, what, it, it's a mantra yoga, so. How long do you do the meditation? I practiced it, uh, well, part of the program that I practiced, and it's 20 minutes twice a day. What about the other 23 hours and 20 minutes a day? Well, that is, well, I'm not finishing any of my answers here, but... Well, then we'll take it part by part, then we go on. Part? We can take it part by part. Okay. So what about the other 23 hours and 20 minutes? There's not a lot to do, but it's one of the reasons I stopped in here. No, <laughs> 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 well, This is the point. It's just that it's just right. But just like an elephant... But there's a reason Just like an elephant... No, the point... Your, your point is well taken. Something is better than nothing. It says sometimes impersonal realization can help one because it gets one detached from the material world. Exactly. But to actually, to actually, in this life, a very short life, we want to be able to finish up. And that there's no guarantee that by practicing impersonal meditation you can finish up because as soon as you stop meditating, your link with the transcendence is finished. Then you're actually, you're, you're working your way down and then again, it's like the elephant. When the elephant so takes the bath, means that you, you just like you meditate, right? You're in touch. You're when you're meditating, then you're in the spiritual consciousness. If you're able to actually meditate properly, and right. if you're otherwise pure, but as soon as you stop meditating, then immediately again you're in touch with the three modes of material nature. So then immediately again the covering process of karma start coming up. You're, right. you're gaining karma. This is described as bathing like the elephant. When the elephant goes in the water and bathes, it wipes itself, gets all clean. As soon as it comes out, it takes mud, it takes dust, and throws it all over its body. So it's like that you meditate, and again, you really, as soon as you stop, again, your material activities begin. Well, you know, that's a degree, the idea is Whatever. You being, you, you, a, person, a person, it may be even lesser. You see, it may it may be that they, they're gradually, by the influence of the meditation, they're giving up habits in the mode of ignorance and passion to some degree. You see, but still, even if their activities are in the mode of goodness, the activities are yet in the material world. But the Gita is saying we have to transcend the three modes. So there in the Bhagavad Gita, can you look up the verse, Mancha Yoga Vichari Na Bhakti Yoga Na Sevate Sagunan Samajita Itan Bhuma Bhuvaya Kalpate the saguna, atit. Gunas mean the three modes. Atit means to go beyond the three modes. Saguna, samadhi, taitan. To transcend the three modes. This is immediately done when one is engaging in devotional service. Can you translate it? One who engages in full devotional service does not fall down in circumstance that one transcends the world of material nature and thus comes to the level of time. You understand the explain? As soon as you're engaging in devotional service, then you're constantly in the meditation, just like we're cooking. Or for ordinary yogi, cooking is the material activity. We have to eat. You see. So when they're cooking, there's sin involved. Karma is involved in killing the various animals or, or plants or whatever they're eating. Hopefully if they're eating plants, there's less karma. If they're eating vegetarian milk products like that. If they're eating uh, meat, then that's uh, more in the mode of ignorance and passion. Then it's very hard for them to actually be freed from the karmas or even to develop spiritual wisdom. This is the problem. We had many uh, acharyas or teachers of the TM system in Australia who had actually paid the four thousand dollars and gone to hardware, wherever it is, which it is, and uh, learned how to levitate. They could come off the ground foot. Then because but because they they weren't uh, following uh, all the pure habits or whatever. While they were levitating, the boom, they fall forward. They have rubber, rubber foam, you know. So then, you know, since they get off of the boom, and they fall down, so they can't stand. Because they can't, their nervous system is not enough to maintain pure being. You gain that for the moment, and as long as we're established in pure being, you get that the effect. But because we have perfected the technique, 
don't maintain that awareness in the transmittal transmittal field. We don't maintain the awareness beyond the three units. And that's why then we pop back out and lose that, that power that influence and it makes it come back down gradually right. as we become more detached from the practice and more established in being we are able to maintain the forces that cause to the point, the point, the point is that nobody can stay in the meditation 24 hours a day. Unless you're very, very advanced. You have to, you know, obviously you have to always break it and go on and do so many things. The process of this meditation is recommended in detail in the sixth chapter that once you go in a cave or some ashram or some forest and just sit down and only meditate 24 hours a day like that. Just living off leaves and things in the forest. But uh, nowadays, who is uh, capable of doing that? So this is a process that's recommended that by performing devotional service, then immediately you're in the transcendental platform. Did you read part of the purport? So this way, you see, devotional yeah. service, you can do 24 hours a day. It's the same standard of meditation. Because Krishna is on the transcendental platform, the activity you're doing it's a sacrifice to him. The whole activity is an act of meditation. And through the activity, one is constantly experiencing spiritual bliss. Even you learn to levitate, but there's no, there's not that extent of spiritual bliss in that, uh, in that levitation or in that meditation. Because it's an impersonal meditation, it doesn't actually fully satisfy all the desires. Even, even the person who can do these things, still the desire, the seed of desire is there in the heart. And the one is not fully satisfied, and the danger of always again falling down into gross sense gratification is very prominent. The difference is that because devotional service is actually above the three modes, that immediately it actually stops the material desire, it, it submerges it, because all the desires are, are dovetailed in a spiritual process, spiritual service. So gradually a person completely transcends all the material desire because of purifying the desires and is experiencing at every moment spiritual ecstasy. In this way one can constantly maintain himself above the three modes and every activity because it's always connected with Krishna under the guidance of a fide spiritual master is not creating any karma. As soon as you stop meditation you go out and as soon as you take co call or take this, take that, if you don't know the process of Vata Yoga you may be creating karma. You cannot help but create karma. But the Dvakti Yogi doesn't create any karma the whole day. Even before he self realized. Even before he self realized. I don't believe you, but according to what I'm thinking, the time is created. This is the time is created. The time is created. This verse is a reply to our current question. What is the meaning of attaining this transcendental position? As explained before, the material world is acting under the spell of the mode of material nature. One should not be disturbed by activities of the modes of nature. Instead mm -hmm. of putting his consciousness into such activities, he may transfer his consciousness to Krishna activities. Krishna activities are known as Krishna Yoga, always acting to Krishna. You see, what is the, what is the meaning of self-realization? When you know that you're not the body, and when you act on the, on the spiritual platform, that's self-realization. So, just like the self that's separate from the bodily activities, not against That's, that's, you see, when you actually see the self, at the same time you have to see God. Because on the absolute platform, God and the self are connected. It's not that you just have self-realization without God-realization. That's a misconception. When you realize the self, simultaneously you either have to realize the Paramatma or Brahman or Bhagavan. If you realize Paramatma, you also realize Brahman. If you realize Bhagavan, you also realize Paramatma and Brahman. And if you realize this Brahman, but you, you can't just like realize, you want to just see the soul and the spirit. When you actually have a real vision of the soul, then you're also going to see the source of the soul which is connected. You're going to see the existence that the soul is in. Just like if I'm going to see you in your physical existence, I'm going to see you sitting here in, a, in Atlanta, Georgia. And if I suddenly come up another level and see you on the psychic platform, 
on the Astro platform, then I'll see you and I'll see a whole different situation. You see, I'll see so many other astro bodies, even a few maybe sitting here that we don't see. Correct? When you come up to the spiritual plan, it's not that this you suddenly see only yourself. You are the self. You don't see the self. You see that yourself. You suddenly are able to see the truth. Now you're seeing from your eyes. Then the mental platform you're seeing from your mind. And then when you're self-realized, you see yourself from the self, and then you see the truth at the same time. So this Brahmati, Paramatmati, Bhagavanati, Sabhyati, truth is realized as impersonal life, as localized super soul, or as the personal form of Bhagavan. The patients are there. So many people, have in the, I don't know what uh, Maharishi advises now, but many years ago when people would request him that they wanted to full-time practice and they wanted to actually perform bhakti yoga, that in the beginning of his movement he would send people to Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada saying that he is a perfect bhakti yogi. And he why, can teach why you. Why he that? Because he's teaching Patanjali. He doesn't know the process of bhakti yoga. He's teaching, he's teaching some aspect, I don't know fully what he's, but I understand he's teaching some aspect of the Pantanjali Yoga system. That's what the program is. Right, so the point is that, <coughs> that, that system, Krishna, can you read where Krishna, what, how Krishna describes that this process of impersonal realization is very difficult? Mm-hmm. But to me it doesn't seem very difficult in my experience. It's just that when I meditate, I experience peace, violence, peace, purity. And when I come, when I come out into activity, I carry that with me. I feel very calm and very peaceful, very more ident- less identified with the body and activity. But it's true that depending on what I do, I may lose that, or if it's engaged in activity through strenuously, it fades. It's like dipping a cloth into a yellow dye. And then pulling it out into the sun, and it begins to fade. It doesn't fade all completely. And you dip it in until it comes out the color back, in and out, in and out. That's his, that's his task. Meditate and then just perform normal household right. so so activity during the day. That's why the, the activities in the mode of goodness are compared to yellow. Activities in the mode of passion are compared to red. And activities in the mode of ignorance are compared to black, a dark blue. So things like, uh, Having, you know, having orgies or uh, taking intoxication, gambling, uh, eating meat, things like that. These are in the mode of ignorance. Things like uh, passion or business deals and uh, <coughs> other type of uh, maybe sporting events or things like that. They're a mixture of passion, some ignorance. Doing some ordinary routine work which doesn't involve, which is... Uh, is necessary for the upkeep of the body and then serving others and doing some charitable work, things like that. These are more in the mode of goodness, purity, healthy activities, things like that. So, you're meditating. Of course, I don't know whether your mantra that he's given you is a transcendental mantra or whether it's a mantra based upon Shiva or something else, which is... Let's see. A lot of times he gives Shiva mantras, which gives good results. But it's not exactly transcendental. It's just, it's, it's, uh, well, it's above the material, it's, uh, it's right in between transcendental and material. It's at the borderline. It's not enough to actually give you liberation, but it'll help you get there. Well, Hare Krishna Chan is, uh, is a transcendental mantra. How is it, how does it produce transcendence if it's, it's always practiced? Haridas Thakur was a great uh, name that Lord Chaitanya as the spiritual master of the holy name. And he used to chant 300,000 times Hare Krishna every day. So he would chant 100,000 times loudly, 100,000 times just so he himself could hear it, no one else. And 100,000 he would chant them. So he answered the question of why we chant loud saying that because we chant loud, that loud chanting is actually a hundred times or more uh, valuable than chanting softly. Because what 
other living entities because it's a powerful vibration. And this particular chanting of Hare Krishna, most mantras you're not allowed to say out loud because the mantras themselves are not powerful enough to purify someone who is not already purified to some extent. So by saying it out loud, rather it doesn't, it simply, it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't actually help anyone. In fact, they may commit offenses or something and it may harm them spiritually. So therefore, there are some mantras that you have to actually be purified to chant. The Hare Krishna Mahamantra is described in the Vedas as a special mantra for this age, which can completely negate all the contamination of the Kali Yuga. Iti soda sakam nam nam kali kalama shana shanam nata parata upaya sarva vede chidishyate Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Rama